the video before it gets published. All right, should I let some people in? Okay, great. Yeah, are you good to go, Daniel? Yep. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. We'll just wait a moment for people to join us. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. And today we're having our final talk about developments in isogeny-based cryptosystems. And we're very happy today to have Damien Robert speaking about applications of isogenies between abelian varieties to elliptic curve cryptosystems. And Damien, okay. is it all right if I can record this talk? Yeah, sure. Wonderful, and feel free to ask questions during the talk if any occur to you. Hey, go ahead. Okay, so great, thanks. I'm very honored to give the last, last talk on the isogeny sessions. So uh, today we're going to see application of isogenies between abelian varieties, so in higher dimensions and in dimension one, to elliptic curve crypto system. So we mainly speak about uh, post quantum crypto system, but at the end, if I have time, I will mention some application to classical crypto system. So first, some reminders about uh, post quantum crypto system that use isogenies of elliptic curves. I know you have seen at least two talks on this already, so hopefully this is just a reminder, but let me mention it anyway. So the idea is to do a key exchange on the graph, and the graph will be, we'll see uh, isogenies between elliptic curve. Now what I'm going to describe now is a commutative version of this graph. So imagine that you have a graph with 26 nodes, which represents the letter from a to Z, and the idea is that Alice and Bob will transmit public information on this graph, and at the end they will uh, both switch the same vertices, so one of these letters, 26 letters, and only them will be able to uh, reach these common lattices, and this would be the first uh, letter of their, let's say, secret key, and they can uh, try again to increase the size of their secret key. So the idea here is to do a key exchange algorithm. So here it's a very simple graph where from each node, I think you can see my mouse, there are two kinds of arrow, the blue dot arrow and the full green, greenish arrow. So the idea is that everyone starts with the letter A and at least follow a path, which I denote by integral 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. So 0 means the full uh, path, the full edge, and one mean follows the dotted edge. So she goes zero, zero, one, 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 zero, and she arrives at the letter W. So what she does, she keeps her path secret and she only publishes W. Bum does the same thing, so he takes a random path, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. So let's follow that, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. And he arrives at the letter L. So once again, his path is secret, and he only output the letter L. So now Alice can go back to her whole path, but this time start from Bob's letter L. So she follows zero, zero, one, one, one zero and she gets G. Bob starts from Alice W. He follow his path one zero one one zero one and the magic is that he arrives at G two. So if you look at the full key exchange, that's why I call it a commutative graph. If you do the blue path followed by the red path, or the red path followed by the blue path they both arrive at the same common secret, which is G. Now, if you think about uh, an attacker, so if we try to break the system, what does she know? She knows that everybody starts at A, and she knows that Alice got W and Bob got L. So to attack the system, she only needs to find a path between A and W or L. 
So of course, in this toy example, it's very easy to do it by hand. So in practice, we need graph with bigger nodes. So here's an example of a key exchange with more nodes. So it's starting to be harder to find the path by hand, but still very easy for a computer. So we need even more nodes. So this is a graph like 600 nodes, like it's all double letters the alphabet. So we don't see much. So by hand, it's impossible to attack it. For a computer, it's still completely trivial. So it's still not enough nodes at all. So if we look at a bit at the security we require, uh, we require something like 2 to the 128. Uh, more than that, if we look at meet in the middle attack, we need 2 to the 256 8 bits, uh, 2, to the 100, 2 to the 256 nodes to have a secure graph. And moreover, what we need is for a good graph for a key exchange is a graph with a good mixing properties which means that if we follow a small random path, we are more or, more or less uniform across the whole path. What we don't want to do is to need to follow a long, a very large path to be uniform. We need to follow a path of length log n because n is going to be very big. So we need a path of length log n to be able to do a fast scan change and it should give us a uniform mode. So as I said, I forgot to put it in the set, but there will be a lot of nodes. So the full graph will not fit in memory. So in practice, it would be represented by an algorithm which takes a node as an input and give you the neighboring nodes. So one instantiation of this idea that's bad from at least 20 years ago from Kuven and then Rostov said Stolbunov. So the idea is to use the isogenic graph of ordinary elliptic curves. So the nodes of the graph will be uh, elliptic curve with uh, fixed complex multiplication over FP, and then the path will be isogenous. Some small degrees isogenous between these elliptic curves. So the graph will be loosely of size square root of P, so we need a pretty large P. And this is a commutative graph because it acts on there by the class group of the endomorphism ring, and the class group is commutative. So the nice thing about the commutative graph is that the key exchange is, as I showed here, except of course the graph is way bigger, so very simple to describe. The bad thing about commutative graph is that if we care about post-quantum security, so if we want to use a graph of elliptic curve as it has a discrete logarithm in elliptic curve, we want post-quantum security because discrete logarithm are broken by quantum computers, so uh, that's why we want to use graph. And in the quantum setting, finding a path between uh, the two nodes in the graph is called, uh, can be seen as an instance of the hidden shift problem, and it's solvable in quantum sub-exponential sub time. So it's still nice, quantum sub-exponential is still, is still going to be a very hard problem, but we would like to have exponential quantum security. So the idea is much more recent. Uh, it's called SIGN. It's from 10 years ago from Defeo, Zhao, and Plut. And the idea is to use uh, the graph of super singular elliptic curves rather than ordinary elliptic curves. And so we look at the isotonic graph of super singular elliptic curve over FP square. There will be roughly P such super singular elliptic curves. And the nice thing is that the graph is non commutative. So we want to do isogeny based k change. We use super singular curves. The nice thing is the graph is non commutative. The bad thing is the graph is non commutative. So this means that the k change that showed here, white paths and blue paths, or blue paths and white paths, will not work in the super singular setting because we are not commutative anymore. So, how can we do a k change in the super singular setting? So, here is the protocol. So here are some so protocol used in practice. We select P, which is 2 to the A, A times 3 to the B minus 1. So we fix NA, which is going to be 2 to the A. So Alice is going to follow uh, isogeny of lengths 2 to the A, of degree 2 to the A. And NB is going to be 3 to the B. So Bo will follow an isogeny of degree 3 to the B. We start with E0, which is y square equal x cubed plus x, which is super singular in our setting. Or sometimes we take another E0, which is also super singular. 
And the nice thing about the prime we selected is that the n torsion and the n b torsion is defined over fp square. So we have a basis p a q a of the n a torsion and a basis p b q b of the n b torsion. So Alice is going to select a socket of the genie of degree two to the a. So she select a random combination of p a and q a, random linear combination. So our circuit will be s a which is an integral between zero and Na minus one. And the kernel of isogeny will be Pa plus Sa QA. Bob does the same thing. He select a random integral Sb and the kernel of his isogeny will be Pb plus Sb QB. So we start with E0. Alice has our isogeny phi A, which is secret. And she arrived to a tick of Ea, which is public. So everything is green is public. Everything in red is secret. Bob starts with phi b and he arrives at eb. And the common secret will be eab, which is going to be the push forward, which make this diagram commutative. So eab is a shared secret. And the kernel of e0 to eab is the sum of the kernel of Alice and Bob. So in practice, how do Alice compute phi prime b to find eab? Well, the kernel phi a prime here is phi b of p a plus s a of q a because of this equality here, and phi prime b as kernel phi a of p b plus s b of q b. So in order to be able to compute this kernel, Alice needs to know the information by Bob. So Bob needs to publish the image of p a and q a. So p a and q a is the basis of Alice, and Bob publishes the image of this basis with his isogeny phi b. So this shows that the kernel of Alice now can be computed as P A prime plus the secret of Alice Q A prime. Of course, Alice does the same thing. She publishes the image of the N B torsion by her isogeny. And so Bob can compute the kernel of phi prime B as P prime B plus S B Q prime B. And so uh, this is really the thing that makes things work is that Alice and Bob need to publish some extra information. So it's not only EA and EB, but it's also the image of the NA torsion and the image of the NB torsion, which make this key exchange work. That's what we call torsion points. So the key exchange in itself is very fast. So it's a log in, uh, of NA plus log of NB times the largest point factor dividing NA to the one half. So in practice, this factor is going to be uh, LA is going to be two, LB is going to be three. So that's very small. So it can be done in quasi-linear arithmetic operations. So we have a fast k-change algorithm and it was used for a long time and there was no attack. So now let's look at two problems concerning uh, isogenies. So one way to break the system would be to find a path in the super singular isogeny graph. And the other way to break the system would be to use this extra image, which are published, so these torsion points, and see if this extra information can be used. So let's formalize this into some problems. So we're going to look at the evaluation problem, which is given an anisogeny f on the point q, we want to evaluate it f of q. So this is supposed to be fast because this is what is going to be used for the key exchange, at least if any smooth. And then the reverse of the evaluation is going to be the interpolation, which is given the tuple P and FP. So what is given by the evaluation, we want to work over F. So by the way, what I call an anisogeny here simply means that the kernel is of size N. And here we always assume that my isogenies are of degree prime to P, so we have, we deal with separable isogenies. So uh, more formally, the N and prime interpolation problems means that we have an N isogeny on P a point of N prime torsion. And so we have P and its evaluation F of P. And what we want to do is we want to evaluate it on another point Q. So that's what I mean by evaluation is be able to, from P F of P, be able to evaluate it on any other point Q to get f of q. And essentially, this is enough to break SEDF. So of course, in order for f to be entirely determined by p and fp, we need to assume that n prime is greater or equal to n. 
And actually, what we really use is uh, the weak interpersonal problem is that we are not only given the image of a point, but we are given the image of the full basis of uh, n torsion. So that's exactly the setting of SIDH. We are given the image of the full n torsion. So inside, the key change, like I said, they use the NA and NB elevation problem. And uh, breaking the key exchange, it could be finding a path in the graph, or it could be forget about the graph and try to break the weak interpolation. So it would be solving the weak interpolation problem where n is equal to na and n prime is equal to nb. And you can remark that in the side setting, both n and n prime are smooth. So maybe this can help us to solve the problem. Can we solve that in polylogarithmic time? So, uh, like I said, uh, that's uh, the idea of the attack is we are going to use torsion points and not at all uh, try to break directly the uh, super singular graph. So we'll first start with the evaluation problem because that's a simpler one. So an isogeny f, we can always write it of the form g over h, so a rational function, times y over times g over h prime. And H is simply the kernel. So because the kernel is stable by minus one, we can uh, specify the kernel simply by specifying the X coordinate of the kernel. And we encode that with a univariate polynomial H, which is going to be of the degree essentially N minus one over two if N is uh, odd. So we have formula from value. I forgot to put the date, but it's uh, 1970, something like that. So at least 50 years ago. So this value formula, given an n isogeny, we can evaluate f of q in time of n, simply given the kernel k of f, so the polynomial defining the kernel. In the special case where uh, the kernel is generated by point t and the point is over f q, so in, in general, even if the kernel is rational, the generator will not be rational, but in the context of size, this is the case. In some contexts, this is the case. So when the generator is rational, there is a new algorithm uh, from two or three years ago called value square root two, which like the name indicate, can evaluate f in time o tilde of square root of n. So square root of n, if you forget about logarithmic factor. So essentially what you need to remember is that the evaluation takes linear time, but uh, in N, but if N is smooth, so a product of small prime factors, we can decompose F into a product of small isogenies. And so using this decomposition, the evaluation is going to be a lot faster. We are going to have an evaluation essentially in O tilde in O of log N times the smallest prime divisor of n. Or if you use square root value, if the generator is rational, square root of the largest prime divisor. So if n is smooth, we can evaluate isogeny in logarithmic time. So here we need to be a bit careful that the decomposition itself is also quasi logarithmic if the kernel of f is, uh, is rational as a rational generator. It always can be done in polylogarithmic time if n spring is power smooth, because we can always work in smallest extension, uh, which defines the sub kernel and then reconstruct everything by CRT. But in general, even if n is smooth, T will live in a large extension. Uh, and so decomposing the kernel can take a long time. So even a smooth kernel, once you have decomposed it, it's going to be fast to evaluate, but the decomposition can be a bit, a bit long. So even smooth can be long, but in the side setting, we are in the first case, so decomposition is fast. Okay, so that was evaluation. Now let's look at interpolation. So we have a point P, F of P, we can only look at the X coordinates. So what we want to reconstruct is the rational function G over H. So this is a rational function of degree big N in the numerator and denominator. And so we can reconstruct it by interpolating the points XMP, XMF of P for M from one to N minus one and prime minus one, essentially. So here I need N prime greater than two N because I'm interpolating a rational function. Maybe there's a plus one, I don't remember exactly. And so this can be done in quasi linear time because interpreting rational function can be done in quasi linear time. 
And of course, uh, the rational function itself is going to be very big. It won't fit in memory, but why, that's why in the interpolation problem, I asked to evaluate on the point Q directly. And in the interpolation, we can interpolate, evaluate our interpolation on Q directly so that the interpolation gives us F of Q without uh, needing too large memory. Uh, so just uh, one small thing that I wanted to mention that I don't use after one is that uh, there's a nice trick to find the point of order P, uh, which is a characteristic, is to look at the tangent space. A uh, vector in the tangent space can be seen as a fat point of order P. So we can use interpolation, if P is larger than N, we can use interpolation to reconstruct the isogenies. And in this case, interpolation using a derivative is simply a differential equation. And so we recover Alki's method, which reconstruct an isogeny from uh, the modular polynomial, which is essentially gave us the action of the isogeny on the tangent space. So reconstructing an isogeny from interaction of the tangent space can be seen as some special case of the interpolation problem. Okay, so in the case of evaluation, we have seen that we have much faster algorithms than Casilinar when n is smooth. So we can ask the same thing when n prime is smooth. So when we have n prime a point of n prime order, which is smooth, can we find a faster algorithm which will allow us to back side? So in the special case where our point P satisfy F of P is equal to zero, then of course we can because we have the kernel. The kernel is going to be generated by P and N is going to be equal to N prime. So of course, in this case, it's simply uh, the evaluation problem. More generally, if N is equal to N prime and we have the evaluation of F on the basis of the N torsion, we can try to construct the kernel via some DLP. And so once you have the kernel, we are reduced to the N evaluation problem. So this is essentially why the side detection is fast. It's because Bob used the torsion point information given by Alice. So he has the information by Alice and we can use that to construct the kernel and so evaluate the isogeny, the push forward isogeny. So of course, this kind of trick only work if n prime is equal to n, or if there are large prime factor, large factor in command, then we can try to put forth the things remaining. So if there are large factor in command, we can try to find the large part of the kernel and then try to reconstruct f. And of course, there is no reason to explain to expect just uh, this trick to work when n prime is, is prime to n, because the kernel of f we won't have any information about the kernel of F if we only have the action of F on the n-prime torsion. And what we're going to see in this talk is that surprisingly, it's still going to work, this kind of ID. Okay, but before I explain how it's going to work, let me revisit once more the evaluation problem. So for the evaluation problem, we can see that an inisogeny can be evaluated in linear time and it can be evaluated in logarithmic time when n is smooth. Now the question is, well, when n is non-smooth, well, so when, when n has a large prime factor, can we hope to find a logarithmic evaluation? And it happens that in some cases, yes. So for instance, if we are going to try to compute the multiplication by L, so the multiplication by L has degree L square. So if L is prime, n has a large prime factor. So value formula is going to be so slow. We cannot decompose F as a product of small isogenies, but still there is a fast way to compute the multiplication by L, which you all know it, in the double and add algorithm, which allows to evaluate the multiplication by L in O of log L. So let me try to reformulate this and see why what makes the double and add algorithm works uh, for elliptical. Why can we evaluate the multiplication by L in logarithmic time, even through the degree as a large prime factor. So let me introduce an isogeny, which go from E square to E square and takes P1 on P2, two points, and send it to P1 plus P2. So a sum is going to be something we are going to be interested in, and P1 minus P2. What we can check is that it's a two isogeny in dimension two. So I'm not yet defined two isogeny yet, but let's imagine that uh, two is small, so two isogeny is going to be fast to evaluate, even if you are in dimension two. 
So how can we use this isogenine dimension two to do the double on that algorithm? Well, simply the double is simply f of pp, which give us two p and zero. And the addition, we simply do f of pq and we get p plus q, which we enter in, and p minus q, which we can throw away. So in other words, we can evaluate a times q as a composition of log, log l evaluation of f, along with some projection from E square to E and some embedding from E to E square. So in other words, we can see the double and add algorithm on E as a composition of two isogenies in dimension two. So if we think about it, it's really interesting. We managed to decompose an isogeny into a product of small isogeny by going in higher dimension. Like we managed to decompose multiplication by L. And we'd like to do the same thing for more general isogenies. So by looking at higher dimension. So that's now what I'm going to look at. So uh, first, I'm going to need to introduce what n isogenies look like between uh, abelian varieties, so in higher dimension. And uh, one uh, important thing is to keep track of when we work with higher dimension abelian varieties is we need to keep track, keep track of a polarization. So this is something we did not deal with with elliptic curves, but this is something we need to keep track for elliptic, for abelian varieties. So there are several equivalent ways to define what a polarization is. So let me just describe some of them. It can be described as an isogeny from A to its dual. It can be described as essentially an ample divisor on A, so theta A, which was on A. It can be described as a pairing, which is essentially the, the well pairing. And essentially can be used to get projective coordinates. So that's the real reason why we need to work with polarization on abelian varieties is that we are going to use algorithms. So we need to represent our points on our isogenies with projective coordinates. And projective coordinates are given by divisors, ample divisors, and this is just another name for polarization, essentially. And for simplicity, I'll restrict to principal polarizations, which means that the isogeny from A to its dual is an isomorphism, and I'd call that a principally polarized abelian variety. So now that I have principally polarized abelian variety, I can define an n isogeny between them. So f is going to be an n isogeny between a lambda a to b lambda b, where lambda a and lambda b are principal polarization. If the pullback of the polarization lambda b by f is equal to n times lambda a. So that's why it's called an n isogeny. So what is this pullback? Well, we can look at uh, the dual isogeny from B dual to A dual. So we have this diagram, we have F. We have the polarization lambda B which go from B to B dual. We have the dual isogeny F dual, A dual. And the pullback F star lambda B is simply this morphing here. So now what this means is that if I describe, define F tilde to be this morphism here, so F tilde is this morphism here, we can reformulate our condition. F is an isogeny. If the pullback is given by this, it can be reformulated as F tilde F is equal to N. So this is the reformation where F tilde is a contragedant isogeny. And it's not hard to check that it's also equivalent to F F tilde is equal to N. So F tilde is also an n isogeny. And the nice thing about n isogeny is that the kernel of F, sorry, this will be the kernel of F, is the image of F tilde on the uh, n torsion of B. Sorry, I mixed my things here. So it's the image of F. So the kernel of F is the image of F tilde on uh, the bit n torsion of B. So uh, the dual isogeny is a convenient way to recover the the kernel. Okay, so maybe you've seen already that when we work with isogenies between abelian variety, we want to work with kernel which are isotropic for the well pairing. So why is that? Well, it's not hard to check that if you have an isogeny between abelian varieties, the kernel of F is automatically maximum isotropic in A of N because of this condition here, or because of this condition here, and the compatibility between the well pairing and the dual isogeny. So if you have an n isogeny, the kernel is maximal isotropic. 
conversely, it's an SCOM is that if we start with a kernel which is maximal isotropic in the n torsion, then n times lambda a does descend to polarization on the quotient a over k. So to maximize isotropic kernel, we can associate an n isogeny. We can associate a principal polarization on B and an n isogeny from a lambda a to b lambda b. So for elliptic curve, we don't need to care about that because an elliptic curve has only one principal polarization, and all other polarizations are multiple of this one. So the neuron severe group is Z. So that's why the kernel of an isogeny in elliptic curve it's always uh, isotropic for the rail pairing, and there's only one way we can descend the principal polarization to B. So for an elliptic curve and an isogeny, it simply means that the cardinal of the kernel is equal to N. But uh, we need to be careful that in higher dimensions, there may be many non-equivalent principal polarizations. So one striking example is when you take a super singular elliptic curve, you take E square, which is a super singular surface, it has a lot of different polarization. It has P square over roughly P square over 298 product polarizations, which means that A split into a product of super singular elliptic curves uh, where the polarization comes from the product. And it has also P cube over 2880 in decomposable polarization, which means that the polarization corresponds to, to a curve, to a genus 2 super special curve. So the same surface has a lot and lot of different polarization. So it means that we need to be a bit careful when we look at isogeny between AB and variety is that if we already fixed a polarization, principal polarization on B, and we have a kernel which is maximal isotropic in A of N, A, in A of N, it means that N lambda A descend to principal polarization lambda prime B on B because the kernel is maximal isotropic. But there is no reason that lambda prime B is equal to lambda B that we wanted to fix. So the condition F tilde sur F is equal to N. So remember that F tilde depends on lambda B is a stronger condition than simply having a maximal isotropic kernel. So this is the condition we want to check to be sure that lambda prime B is equal to lambda B. Okay, so that's a small subtlety. Maximal isotropic kernel means the polarization descend, but it may not descend to one we had before. And we need this condition to be sure that we are compatible. Okay, so we had algorithm to compute isogeny between elliptic curves. We also have algorithm to compute isogeny between AB and variety. It's a large part of my work, which I did with many co-authors, many with David Lubix, and it took us 10 years to have something satisfying. Uh, so essentially what we do, uh, an abelian variety, there are several models to represent it. We use what is called the theta model. And uh, what we take as input is generator for kernel of the isogeny. And so uh, if we have an n isogeny, the kernel will be of size n to the g. So we can hope to have an isogeny in time o to the n to the g. And we managed to do that in the theta model after a lot of work. So our first algorithm was n to the 2g, and then we managed to do that. So it was quadratic. Now we have a linear algorithm. Uh, there's also, when we are uh, a Jacobian of a curve, we can work with like Jacobian of a Clark curve, we can work with Mumford coordinates. So that's what I call the Jacobian model. There's also an algorithm due to Kuven and Azor, which computes isogeny in time n to the g when we are with Jacobians at the beginning and at the end. And it's also not too hard to extend that other algorithm or product of Jacobians. But the problem is that the algorithm is restricted to when we are Jacobians. So it only works when we have G less or equal to three. In dimension four, a generic abelian variety of dimension four is not going to be a Jacobian or a product of Jacobians. And in the application that we are going to see soonish, we are going to need to use abelian variety of dimension four or abelian eight. Uh, so one reason I wanted to mention the Jacobian model is that the theta model has complexity exponential in the dimension. So it also explored, uh, that's why we are, won't be able to deal with very large dimension of variety because it's going to explode. So, of, so what we really want to do is going to work at most in dimension four or things like that. Eight is really uh, starting to be painful. Okay, so just a quick, some quick lemma about uh, isogenies of variety. They compose as you expect. 
So the contract gradient isogeny of J sur K F is F tilde sur J tilde. So it's easy to check that the composition of an N isogeny and an M isogeny is an N times M isogeny. And we are also going to look at the isogeny between products. So when we have an abelianity A with a polarization lambda A, B with a polarization lambda B, we can take the product polarization on A times B. It simply means the product of the isogeny from A times B to A dual times B dual. And so isogenies on products like that from A times B to C times D are going to be given by matrices, two by two matrices. And since the dual is given by the transpose and then you dualize, the contradagonant isogeny is given by this formula here. So this is something I'm going to use. The contradagonant of a matrix is easy to compute. Okay, and so why do we look at products? So we are going to use a lemma which is due to Kenny uh, for elliptic curves from uh, 20 years ago, which was really extended by me for Ben Vitis, but it's a big one when I say extended because you take exactly the same proof, you replace elliptic curve by Ben Variety and it still works. So it's a bit trivial to say that I extended this. Uh, to have been varieties. So as I did as follow, you look at the commutative square of isogeny, A, B, D, or A, C, D. And in this case, we require alpha and alpha prime to both be A isogeny, so they need to have the same degree, and beta and beta prime to both be uh, B isogeny. So in this case, we can look at this matrix here. It go from A times D to B times C. We can look at the contragradient matrix, which is again by this formula due to the, this formula I gave you before. And it's uh, really easy to check. It's a two by two matrix computation to check that F tilde times F is equal to A plus B. Okay, so I want I tend to do it here, but you can take a piece of paper, do this two by two matrix computation. And since the diagram commute here, you get that F, F tilde times F is equal to A plus B. So this means that F is an A plus B isogeny with respect to the product pol polarizations. And of course, the kernel of F, you can look at it by the image of F tilde and the A plus B torsion. So it's very easy to describe the kernel of F. So here, I want to uh, take a moment here because that's something really interesting we constructed. We started with an A isogeny and a B isogeny. So when you have an A isogeny and a B isogeny, it's really easy to construct a B times A isogeny. You simply compose them or something like that. But here we constructed the A plus B isogeny. So we are going in higher dimension because it's an A plus B isogeny on product, but we managed to combine isogeny additively. Whereas before, with composition, we combine isogeny multiplicatively. Can this lemma give us a way to combine isogeny additively by going in higher dimension? So how can we use that to attack the interpolation problem? So assume that I know the image of F on the end prime torsion. So I'm going to attack the weak interpolation problem. And I want to recover F, which is an N isogeny. Assume that we can find an isogeny alpha, uh, n prime minus n, so I call, call, call that m, m is equal to n prime minus n isogeny alpha, that we control and that we can evaluate also on the n prime torsion. So remember that f is an n isogeny and we have the image on the n prime torsion. Then, since we know to let f and we control alpha, we can evaluate f on the n prime torsion and recover its kernel by this simple formula. So in this case, alpha is our alpha here and F is going to be our beta and our diagram. Okay. And so we can construct F, which is going to be a N prime isogeny and we get its kernel. So we reduce the interpolation problem to the N prime evaluation problem of F and this evaluation problem is going to be fast if N prime is smooth. So the full question is, can we find alpha? How can we find alpha? So if M is smooth, M is a product of small prime, we can try to combine small degree isogenies. So that's, for those of you who saw uh, Menon Martindale talks, that's the idea behind the Hattot. If M is equal to L square, we can of course take alpha, which is a multiplication by L. 
So in general, uh, square are going to be rare, but in this case, we can take an endomorphism. More generally, uh, it's like the idea between, between, behind castric and the cruise attack. If the endomorphism ring has an efficient endomorphism, so efficient endomorphism means we can evaluate it on the endpoint torsion of norm M, we can take alpha this efficient endomorphism. So what about the general case? In the general case, M is non smooth, not a square, and we don't know the endomorphism ring. We just know that it contains Z. So the idea to construct an endomorphism, if we only don't, don't have any information, is once again to go in higher dimension. So we needed to go in higher dimension to apply Canis Lemma, and now we're also going to need to go to higher dimension to construct a suitable endomorphism. So for instance, if M is of a sum of two squares, so this already happens quite frequently to be a sum of two squares. So if M is equal to one A1 square plus A2 square, it's easy to check that A1, A2 minus A2, A1 is an endomorphism of norm, the sum of two squares. Essentially, what we use is we use the Gaussian integers, like the, the matrix representation of the complex number. It also works to construct an endomorphism on this square. And more generally, an integer is always the sum of four squares. So we use a fact from number theory. So it dates from uh, Diophantine and Lagrange, so quite long time ago. And once we decompose M as a sum of four squares, we can look at matrix given by quaternion algebra. So it's going to be given by something like that. So this matrix gives us an endomorphism of norm M on E to the four. So maybe I cannot construct an isogeny an M isogeny on an E, but I can always construct an M isogeny on E square when we are sum of two square or at the worst squares on E4. So what it means is that I'm going to apply Canis Lemma when the case where A, B, C, D are not elliptic curves anymore. So that's why I put the general case here. A, B, C, D are going to be powers of elliptic curves, power to the two or power to the four. So the isogeny F is going to be in dimension four or eight. Okay, so if I summarize what you just did, uh, so I described this in dimension one to attack elliptic curve, but of course it also applies to look at isogenies between higher dimension and and variety. So what happened is that an anisogeny in dimension G can always be efficiently embedded into an n prime isogeny F between A prime and B prime in dimension AG. So AG is when we are a sum of four square and sometimes 4G or a sum of two square or 2G. So 2G is when we have an efficient endomorphism or when we are L square or when we M is small. So this is the diagram here. We want to compute F between A and B, but by increasing the dimension, I reduce to computing big F between A prime and B prime. And the important thing is that big F is an M prime isogeny. And an important thing is that n prime can be completely different from n, not have a single common prime factor. So this brings us considerable flexibility at the cost, of course, of going up in dimension. So as we seen, just seen, this breaks SDH side. So we require the dimension two attack of Castrec, Decru, Meno, and Martadal, and the general dimension four and eight attack, which also work when we don't know the endomorphism ring. And more generally, what it shows is that we can reduce the n n prime weak interpretation problem to the n prime relation problem in a higher dimension. So that's quite surprising, right? We, we, we know the action of f on the n prime torsion, and we build f, which is an n prime isogeny, and we know its kernel. So we reduce the inter weak interpretation to the n prime evaluations. So uh, since it's a weak interpolation, I actually don't need n prime greater than n. I only need n prime square greater or equal to n. It uses the dual isogeny of big F. So that's, that can be useful sometimes for application. And so of course it solves a weak interpolation problem when n prime is smooth because the n prime evaluation is fast when we are smooth. So maybe not when we are smooth, but at least when we are poor smooth. And so the amazing fact is that we do not need to know the kernel of F and it also works if N is prime. So uh, we don't care at all about N here. 
we reduce to the n prime relation problem. So even if n is prime, so in the side, side context, n is smooth, but we could imagine other context when n is prime, but as long as n prime is power smooth, we can do the interpolation. So it works even if n is prime. Even more surprising, if you take n prime is equal to n, so you have the action of f on the n torsion, you might think that to recover the kernel of f, you need to do some DLP, and DLP are going to be hard if n is prime. But to evaluate f, you reduce to evaluating big F, and big F, we know it's kernel because it's given by this. So the kernel of big F, we know it. So we can also, when n is equal to n prime, we can evaluate f even uh, if we know the action on the n torsion without doing any DLP. So that's quite surprising. So there's of course one remaining open question. What happens if we have the n prime, n prime interpolation problem and n prime is uh, prime? So we know we can reduce to the n prime relation problem, but the evaluation problem is still going to be hard when n prime is prime. So the question that remains open is that can we find a fast n prime evaluation algorithm? So still, I can say a few words about this. Is that for the n evaluation problem, even when n is prime, once we evaluated f on the basis of the n prime torsion, where n prime are going to take it smooth or power smooth, we are now have an instance of the n prime weak interruption problem, which we have just seen reduced to the n prime relation problem in higher dimensions. So the n evaluation prime is going to be hard if n is prime, but the n prime relation problem is going to be easy if n prime is chosen power smooth. So reformulating thing here, I can say that we can always embed an n isogeny into an n prime isogeny with n prime power smooth, uh, except that the n prime isogeny will be in higher dimensions. So of course, to embed f, we need to evade f on the n prime torsion. So we need to evade it on the two points, essentially. Uh, so this evaluation is going to take a lot of time because n is prime and we are not have an oracle which gives us the image of the n prime torsions. But once we have computed this evaluation, we have big F which is an n prime isogeny and we can decompose as a product of small isogenies, which means that our small isogeny F, we can always represent it as our big isogeny F, which we write as a product of small isogeny. So if we do the computation, the uh, decomposition takes space log cube of n, and then evaluations, if n prime is power smooth, suitable power smooth, takes time log to the seven n. So what this means is that if you take an n isogeny, even if n is primes, once you do the hard part of evaluating it on the smooth, power smooth and prime torsion, the remaining evaluation can be done in polylogarithmic poly poly time. So you can always find a representation of your isogeny, which allows you to evaluate it in polylogarithmic time, even if n is, uh, is prime. So that's quite an uh, unexpected application of uh, the, this uh, kind of uh, trick. And so uh, I have five minutes to uh, now do give us you another application to classical cryptography. So as you all know, for classical cryptography, we need to find an elliptic curve defined over a finite field where the number of points are the large prime factor. So we need to do some point counting. And the question is, how fast can we compute count number of points? So of course, uh, to count the number of points, we want to evaluate the Frobenius because that's the fixed point of the Frobenius is the number of points. And the Frobenius can be evaluated fast in O of log P arithmetic operation because it's just an exponentiation. So you can use the Frobenius to evaluate it, uh, the action of the Frobenius on the tangent space. Uh, but since the Frobenius is non-separable, this action is always zero. So you don't require any information. What is more interesting is to look at the action of the Fershibung. So the Fershibung is a dual of the Frobenius. And the action of the Fershibung is non-trivial, at least if E is non-ordinary. And when you look at the action on the tangent space, it gives you uh, the action of lambda modulo P, where lambda is the invertible eigenvalue of the Frobenius. So the Frobenius has two eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two, one which is zero modulo P and one which is invertible modulo P when E is ordinary. So when you evaluate the Fershibung on the tangent space, you require lambda and from lambda it's easy to require the trace. 
So when you let, so you can require the trace modulo p. So that's nice. And also, so since the first Schibung is a dual of the Frobenius, we have p tilde sur p is equal to p. Pi, the Frobenius is easy to evaluate. P is easy to evaluate. So the first Schibung can be efficiently evaluated on the image of the Frobenius. So unfortunately, we cannot use that to evaluate the Frobenius on uh, the tangent space because the image by the Frobenius on the tangent space is zero. So we cannot use that to evaluate the first Schibung. So what we're going to use instead is to use the same trick that we use here, where we embedded our n isogeny into an n prime isogeny. Here, we're going to embed the Frobenius pi p, which is a p isogeny, into a power smooth isogeny f. This works even uh, if pi p is inseparable. And when we look at the embedding we're going to use, it's actually embed pi p and pi dual on the, on the first Schibung. If you look back at Canis Lemma, here we have beta and beta dual. So it's going to embed both the Frobenius and the first Schibung. And to compute this embedding, I need to evaluate the Frobenius on or the first Schibung on the n prime torsion. But this is doable because n prime is going to be prime to p. So I know to let the first Schibung on the Frobenius on n prime. So I know how to require the kernel of f on n prime. So since I know to require the kernel of f and n prime is power smooth, I can evaluate f on the tangent space and the evaluation of f on the tangent space. So here is going to be in dimension, uh, let's say two in the nice case or four or eight. But the evaluation of f on the tangent space at zero is going to be me the evaluation of pi p on the first Schibung on the tangent space uh, of my ethic curve. So I can recover the action of the first Schibung on the tangent space by evaluating big F. And I wish I look at what the complexity this allows me to recover lambda modulo p in log to the 10 p arithmetic operations. So it's quite similar to Struff algorithm. For those of you who know Struff algorithms, in Struff algorithm, we relate the Frobenius on small light torsion points. We do DLP on this torsion point and we reconstruct the trace modulo the product. Here we're going to evaluate the, first, the Frobenius on this small light torsion point, but we use this evaluation to reconstruct the product of LI isogeny F. We evaluate big F on the tangent space and we recover lambda modulo P. Okay, so this looks worse than Stroph because Stroph is log to the 5p to recover the full trace, whereas here I'm in log to the 10p to only recover the trace modulo p. So I'm, I'm slower than Stroph and I recover less information, I recover only the trace modulo p. But I actually have more information because if I lift my elliptic curve to uh, to the periodic numbers or to the periodic numbers modulo p square and so on, a lift of f, which is unique because big F is et al, will give me a lift of the Frobenius. So computing the lift of f is going to be easy because f is an n prime isogeny and n prime is power smooth and f is et al. And since this lift the Frobenius, this allows to compute, allows me to compute the action of the Frobenius on the deformation space of my elliptic curve. So for those of you who already uh, looked at a canonical lift, computing the canonical lift, what you want to do is look at how the Frobenius act on the deformation space, and then you solve, a new you solve a, an equation. So usually what we use to compute this action is we use modular polynomial to compute the action of the of lift of Frobenius on the deformation space. Here I use an iterative, so here again an iterative method which can describe the action of the Frobenius on the deformation space without the modular polynomial. So phi p is going to be very large, p, p cube. Here I'll use my isogeny f. So the, uh, the quite remarkable thing is that this allow me to compute canonical lift in time polynomial in log p, whereas modular polynomial would be like p cube to compute the modular polynomial. So I can use that to do point counting of, uh, over fp to the n by lifting to position o to the n. 
essentially, because like this idea, I have the Frominus modulo P, and by lifting to precision N, I have the trace modulo P to the N, and this is enough to acquire the trace. So in summary, we have this point cutting algorithm. Uh, so Stroph algorithm is, so when Q is P to the N, Stroph algorithm, as I said, is in log to the phi Q, which is N5 log to the phi P. And essentially, this can be seen as an instance of etal cohomology. So you all know the C algorithm which improves the complexity by one. So here we have N4 log to the four. Uh, but when it P is small, we prefer to use algorithms which have the smallest complexity in N. So we have Kedleya's algorithm which use monsky Rashidar cohomology or rigid cohomology, which is in N cube to the P. So that's usually what happens when you use periodic cohomology. So this is a kind of periodic cohomology. Periodic cohomology is in periodic cohomology. The complexity is going to be somewhat linear in P. So that's why Kedleya is linear in P. And there is an improvement by Harley Harvey, which is uh, worse in N, but it is in square root of P. So the complexity of P in P is better. Uh, the first periodic cohomology algorithm is from Christian cohomology. So this is, so this is one other way to look at canonical lifts is that we are doing Christian cohomology without saying it. So that's the idea being Sato algorithm. And Sato, when you look at it, it has very nice complexity in N, it's N square, but the complexity in P is very bad, it's P square. Uh, it's, and it's not even counting the modular polynomial, which is P cube. It's only counting the evaluation of the modular polynomial. So Sato is very nice N, very bad P. So recently with my PhD student, we managed to improve the P square to P. So to get something like Kedlaya, so better N square and P here. And the new algorithm is allowed to compute lift, to compute lift of pi of the Frobenius, so lift of a P isogeny by looking at an N prime isogeny, smooth. So we are polynomial in log P give me an algorithm, which is n square log eight of p. So here I, I give the full binary operation, n square log eight of p plus n log 11 of p. So compared to Stroph, the complexity is worse, but it's still polynomial in log p. And in n, we are as good as Sato. So we are n square, and we are not as good as c in terms of p, but not too bad still. Log 11, why? Okay, log 11 is bad, but it's logarithmic compared to Sato or Kedlaya. So I thought that was another nice application of uh, this kind of tricks uh, by going to higher dimensions. So we use isogenies in higher dimension to do fast point counting on elliptic curves. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, that's a wonderful application at the, the end for this point counting. Well, this is a, a good time for questions. Would anyone like to ask a question? Maybe I'll start. Um, I'm curious if you've thought at all about applying these techniques to compute the endomorphism ring, not just the trace. I think we still don't know an, a polynomial time algorithm for doing that. Uh, that's a good question. Um... And so no, I'm not thought about it. Um, so uh, yeah, so the question is, you can okay, you can compute canonical lift in polynomial time in log p, whereas before it was exponential time. Can we use it somehow? So application of canonical lift. So I, I talk about the application for point counting. There are also applications like the periodic method to compute uh, class polynomials. Uh, it, used, it can use canonical lift, but of course we also we already have quasi-linear algorithms which use the CRT method, which we developed, or the analytic method. So having a better canonical lift algorithm for class polynomials, it's nice, but it won't change the complexity because we already have quasi-linear complexity. Uh, but yeah, this could be used to compute class polynomials, and it will be interesting to think about. Uh, so think about uh, elliptic endomorphism ring, like can we somehow compute the endomorphism ring of the canonical lift faster than of the elliptic curve itself? That, that would be the question, right? Can we use that 
is it faster on the canonical lift? And the answer is, I don't know, but that's, uh, yeah, that's something that would be interesting to look at. Yeah, I'd, I'd encourage you and others to think yeah. about that problem because I yeah. feel like it's it's waiting to be solved. Um, and just being able to compute the matrix to Frobenius, not just the trace, would be a, would have lots of applications. And of course, you can do it with class polynomials, but that's a terrible way to do it. There, there there's got to be a much better way. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I have other questions, but I don't want, I want to give people in the audience a chance to ask, especially so if they have just, to. Just to mention, so this, uh, when you take about the, having the matrix of the formulas and adjust the trace, so this also works for abelian varieties. And for abelian varieties, what you're going to have is that the action of the Frobenius or the Fersebung on the tangent space. So you get the G by G matrix given by the inverted by eigenvalues. And then from the G time G matrix, it's not hard to get those eigenvalues. So in dimension G, you recover the full matrix and not just the determinant or something like that with this still, kind of method. But you're still just getting it mod P, right? Are you getting the full? I'm getting the action on the tangent space of the canonical okay, lift. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. So I get it modulo any precision I need. Yeah. So in particular, you get the Newton polygon? And the, and the yeah yeah I can get yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. the and the ectal or type can you get that also? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I I I get the I, I think I can get well like the tangent space of the canonical leaf you can see that as half the part of the crystal cohomology but the other half is the dual so essentially I require everything. The, the full action of for provenance on the Christian cohomology. So presumably I can get recover any information that, that depends on that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's probably a lot of other applications and point counting, but just the most natural one that I presented. Another question. So your your new your um Well, I guess maybe it doesn't quite win. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm looking at your new time complexity results and I'm wondering if there's a range at which you could at least arguably be able to set a new point counting record for, for a particular shape of Q. But maybe it's never better than the, no, no, it is, it is. Yeah, you sh so there ought to be a Q for which your new algorithm can yeah. be better. It works when N is very large and P is very large. Yeah, yeah, which is a kind of a weird case, but- Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> Case that not not happen in practice for anti computer <laughs> system, but in this very particular case, which does not happen, this algorithm should work. But in so practice, the log to the eleven is going to keep to kill uh, yeah. practical application because log eleven is very big. But I was just going to say that doesn't stop people who are computing discrete logs in finite multiple groups of finite fields. They're always you know trying to cook up a, a finite field that has just the right shape that they can break a new uh, discrete log record. So you you yeah. you'd be in you'd be on fair ground to do that. It might be a fun project, um, but the log a lot of might kill you. Yeah. So one way to treat is that uh, have an anti curve and we have a smooth torsion point. But if we have an anti curve with smooth torsion point, large torsion point, we already know it's cardinal. Yeah. So yeah, we need this extension because the kernel of big F is going to live in some. So it's going to be done by small factors. But H point given by this small factor is not going to be rational, except if we really sieve our points. So maybe by sieving our P, by cheating, so that this point live in really small extension and not log of L, uh, like not of extension of degree L, but much smaller, we couldn't prove the complexity, but that's cheating. In general, the L torsion is going to believe in extension of L square, so that's that's huge extension. So. Yeah. Well, and Drew, I know you had one uh, last question. Do you want to ask that now, or? Yeah, sure. Maybe as 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 we're wrapping up our uh, our series on isogeny uh, de based developments in isogeny based cryptography, uh, it seems appropriate maybe to ask our, our last speaker to. Uh, share any reflections they have on, on the impact of, of the events of the last three or four months and, and where that leaves us or, or where do we go from here? 
So uh, clearly the impact had been devastating for Side. So it's a bit of a shame because Side was uh, like the flagship for uh, post-consum isogeny-based cryptography. But I need to stress that the attack does not at all look at uh, finding a path in the supercellular graph. It only uses uh, weak interpretation problems, so the extra torsion points. So every other protocol that do not reveal this information remains secure for now and strongly secure. And I, I believe they, they will remain secure. And so we can mention uh, some signatures algorithms like SkySign. And also, of course, the commutative version, which has a sub exponential quantum attack, but sub exponential quantum is still pretty pretty nice like, uh, complexity. Like we use RSA for a long time, even though it has a sub exponential classical uh, complexity. Uh, but now, what is completely open and would be interesting is to find a new uh, quantum cake change algorithm that only relies on the isogeny pass problem in the super singular pass and do not output torsion point information. Uh, so, and maybe these new tools that we have could help doing this kind of k change protocols. I know that uh, Antonin Leroux has a new version of an encryption protocol, key exchange protocol, which use a quaternion, the during correspondence. So it relies on the difficulty of evading isogenies of large prime degree. So, there are still some protocols that uh, we can use that are not broken. Uh, I, I need to mention that, however, like there were some patches trying to uh, to save sides. So, for the attack to work, it need to we need to know the degree of the isogeny and we need to know the uh, image of the torsion point. So there was some ID by Futsa and some other uh, Japanese author. Uh, but masking the degree and masking the image of the torsion point. But they did some analysis and to have a secure side, we can use a well pairing to acquire the degree, information about the degree. We can use uh, some tricks to cancel the masking of the torsion point. They, they shows that trying to get a secure system using this masking will result in huge key cells, which was the advantage of side was the small key cells. And using this counter measure will completely destroy these advantages. So, like the current instance of side when with the counter measure is not is not useful anymore clearly. But the hope is that we can find another key change protocol in the super isogeny isogenic path. But that's an open question. But hopefully, with the new tools that we have, we will manage to find something that is nice. Thank you so much for coming today. So thank you for having me. So that ends our uh, session on developments in isogeny-based crypto systems, and we will return in February with more Vantage talks in the winter season. Have a wonderful uh, holiday break, and um, see you soon. See you. Thank you.